for that. Uh, boy, those lights are bright, but it's good. I can't see who's in the crowd and how many people are here because I get very nervous when I speak. Uh, I don't have an order in Canada. I don't have five honorary degrees. As a matter of fact, I have one hard-fought degree that took me five years to get. And uh, so, uh, but I'm very proud of that. But I want to uh, welcome everybody here today for taking time out of your very busy schedules to join us. As I say, this is the fifth year and everyone has been uh, very successful. When I look at the, uh, the name Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, it rings so true today because when I look at our forests and our farms and our fields, a lot of the uh, solutions that we are going to find for today's issues are located right there. And often I think we, f we find that the, forests, the forestry industry and the agriculture and food industry are viewed as being very staid and not very innovative and old fashioned. And you're gonna hear today, nothing could be further from the truth than that. Um, I'm gonna give you a, just a couple of minutes of where I see some of the needs and some of the solutions that we have uh, for AI bio and the f uh, forestry, food and agricultural industries. The first example I'm going to give is, if we look back not that many years ago, and we find companies like Hewlett Packard, Blackberry, Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and how did we transform the information technology industry? We transformed that by young, entrepreneurial, technically very sound, very visionary people who took an opportunity and developed it into world-class business and uh, lifestyle solutions. We are at the locus right now in agriculture, food and forestry, in the area of biology, where we've got to encourage the very same thing to happen. And I would encourage our institutions of higher learning to start creating some of those technically sound, very good graduates that have that entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial spirit bent to them that we can do the same kind of thing with uh, biology that we did with information technology. And I know we can do that. So I would encourage us, we've somehow got to get this idea that agriculture, food and forestry are not exciting industries. So let's see if we can make that happen. Uh, it's been mentioned 9 billion people by 2050. I think that's a fact. 9 billion people means a lot. There's going to be very few jurisdictions in this world. The CIA has reported there may be five or six jurisdictions in the world that are going to be net exporters of food and agricultural products. Canada will be one of those. So we've got to find out how we can produce more <clears throat> on less water, less land, and less resources. A huge, huge challenge. That's going to require incredible in innovation. One of the ways of we've always done that in industry is we ramp up efficiency. We drain every piece of wetland. We farm wall to wall. We clear cut forests. We do all of those things. We all want efficiency, but we can't do it in the same way that we've done it in the past. We are going to have to have sustainable and efficient production. And that's a very big mindset change for many of us in industry. And this group in this room are going to be the ones that are going to uh, take that next step and help us deal with how can we be very, very efficient and very, very sustainable. And you hear some interesting presentations today. We need novel products. Uh, the world has changed. Food is no longer food. We go through a fad about every six months. There's being health claims and non-health claims that are not scientifically proven. But having said that, we have to know much, much more about what is in the crops, the livestock, uh, the forests, and how we can create novel products for use in an industry and for our nutrition. There's a great conference coming up in Calgary, I think, Elizabeth, in a couple of weeks now, called Ingredients for Success. If you haven't registered for it, I would strongly suggest you do, because there we will be talking about how can we can create the kind of science we need to take food ingredients to help society live and feel better. We're in a system of hyper science. And along with that, a lot of what we do and a lot of what we fund is research and a lot of what the researchers do is falling on more and more skeptical ears. Science is so far out ahead of the general public now that we've got to do a much, much better job of explaining what we do and how we do it than we've ever done it in the past. 
And that's hard for us as farmers because we've never had to do that before. I'm sure it's hard for many of you in this audience who are researchers because you've never had to do that before. You all have your favorite molecule or your favorite piece of science. Most people don't understand what the hell it is you do. And we've got to do a much, much better job of that or what I do. We've got a huge public relations industry in our sectors, agriculture, food and forestry. Uh, the consumer is looking over our fences and in amongst our trees and asking some really tough questions. What are you doing and why are you doing that? And uh, we have to come up with strong messaging and bring some calm to those audiences if we can. Arguably, we always fall back on science as being a message. They just don't believe us anymore. This is much more than just science. The last comment I'm going to make is about globalization, and I'm not going to talk about globalization as we traditionally do. In other words, the world is getting smaller and we need free trade agreements and we've got to sell to each other. I'm going to leave that to the politicians to sort out those things. When I talk about globalization, I'm talking about the fact that we've got a huge part of this world that is not nearly in the same situation as we are here. It's funny, you know, when I, when, I look, when I travel around the globe, and we do a lot of developmental work in South America and Africa and parts of Asia, and I hear we talk about food safety here, absolutely critical. When you go over to some of these countries, they're talking about food security. And now when I go to the Middle East, they talk about food sovereignty. And Africa is talking about food sovereignty and the amount of land that's being purchased in Africa by the developed world. And they're now concerned about their food sovereignty. I think we have to understand all of that. The 9 billion people are just not a statistic. The 500 million people that are malnutritioned every day, the 20% infant mortality rate in some countries of the world are not just statistics, they are real people. And we must do something here for the public good, not just for our own commercial good, and I want to emphasize that. I'm leaving today going to Fargo, North Dakota. Why would I go to Fargo, North Dakota? Well, I have some business interests there, but the reason I'm going to Fargo, North Dakota is there's three U.S. business people and myself, a lady, two gentlemen, and myself, who started a partnership called the Shamba Partnership. We've purchased some land in Ghana where we're setting up a demonstration farm for farmers to help them develop some of their indigenous crops, cassava, millet, but also how can we take some of the agriculture in Ghana and produce new crops that can be commercially viable. And the first one we're looking at is, is pineapple. Our goal ultimately is to have a pineapple processing plant in Ghana. So these are the kinds of things that I think we all have to think about when we, when we come from a society as blessed as we are here in Canada and in Alberta. The last comment I would make is there's really only, I used to think there was only three reasons to be in business. And I think I maybe have mentioned this once before. The first reason is to love what you do every morning and get excited about it. And I hope you all feel that way because I do. When I get up in the morning, I can't wait to get to work, other than speaking, of course. I could have waited for this for many, many years. <laughs> the second thing is to learn something new every day and talk to somebody with an opposing view to yours. I learned that from President Clinton. That's the only way you really grow and expand. The third reason is to make some money, to be sustainable in some fashion. And there's a fourth reason to be in business, and that is to leave a legacy. And that can be your time, it can be your intellect, it can be money if you have it. But I would encourage you all to enjoy the day, uh, communicate with each other. I look forward to, I met many of you who are here because I've been here for five years as well. Uh, thank you very much for coming and all the very best.